Welcome to Lot One Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us on site and online tonight as we worship the Lord together. It's good to see all of you. It's been an exciting week at Lifeline. We had our business and community uh, leaders luncheon yesterday, and it was packed, and we had a great time and great food. Give our Little Rock ministry team a hand and thank them for all that they do. And so we have had an exciting week. Of course, we celebrated Easter on Sunday. We're getting ready for our services this coming Sunday. A lot of things going on in our church. Tonight, if you make sure that you have your care prayer guide for April 20th, 2022, we will go over that list tonight with you. And then we want to pray for the lost, and then we want to pray for our community as well. So please be mindful of that. And this is our most updated list. Let me go over this list with you tonight as we serve the Lord together here in God's house. And so we want to pray tonight for Carolyn Adcock, Anna Allen, Sharon Bartlett. Wanda Cable desperately needs our prayers tonight, so please pray for her. Delton Calhoun, Rose Cooley. Brian Davis is in the hospital at the Heart Hospital. He's had a procedure today, and he will have a major procedure tomorrow. And so he desperately needs our prayers. And so uh, he did have a procedure today that will enable him to have a procedure tomorrow. But tomorrow is a big day for the Brian Davis family. And so please lift them up in our prayers tonight. Delta Calhoun, he's here, Rose Cooley. And then uh, Peggy Davis, continue to pray for her, of course, with her own treatment and health issues. And she has a procedure coming up, but also uh, her concern for her children, and so uh, especially Brian's health, and Kelly's gotten a kidney, and we're so thankful for that, and I believe that God can heal Brian. If you do, say amen. 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 And then Helen Dixon, Keith Eason, Amy Fowler, Dana Fowler, Paula Gaffer, Glennon Esther Glasscock. And also tonight, we need to pray for Nancy Glasscock. She had a uh, surgery on her hand today for a carpal tunnel, and so please remember to pray for Nancy and lift her up in, in her, your prayers. She's going to be on a couple of uh, weeks recovery, and so pray for her. Kathy Glover, Bernice Henley. Nan Howard is at the Heart, Heart Hospital. I talked with her late this afternoon, and she feels like she's a little better. And so she's hoping to get everything figured out and to know what's going on with her. Uh, but I was so glad to be able to talk with Nan Howard. Paul Kelly, Kelly Kemp. Kelly needs our prayers as well as Jerry, and so please pray for both of them. Mary Lewis, Pam Mathis, Bertha Meeks, Hazel Morales, Nona Myers, Terry Perry, and just pray that God continue to work in Terry Perry's life and Wanda Ridens is very ill tonight at the uh, at St. Vincent. In fact, unless God intervenes, Wanda will not be with us through the remainder of the week. And so please pray for Wanda Ridens. I was up there late today, and uh, when I walked in, she said, well, in a very broken voice, she can barely breathe or talk, and she said, I'm about to die. And she knows exactly what's going on. So please pray for Wonder Ridings and for Dee. And please remember to pray, especially tonight, for Avery and Carson. And so, and just pray for us as we minister to all these folks. A lot of things going on there. But Wonder Ridings desperately needs our prayers tonight. And uh, so Dee was waiting for word from the doctor uh, to see if there's any hope at all. Uh, right now, it didn't look very hopeful at all. And so please pray for them. David Singleton, he was here Sunday with his mother, Jean, Earl Smith, Bill Spann, Carolyn Spann. Joy Taylor has been struggling with her voice and vocal cords, and she <coughs> went to the doctor, I believe it was on uh, Tuesday, and they told her that she had some major acid reflux problems, and that was her problem with talking, and so that's a praise. Give the Lord a hand, and thank God for the praise that we have. And so please continue to pray for Joy Taylor. The only other ones that we need to pray for tonight that I've not called out is James Haley is still in the hospital. And so tonight in the hospital, we have Brian Davis, James Haley, Wanda Ridens, Nan Howard. Nancy Glasscock went home from the hospital today. 
So we have all four of these folks in the hospital. Also tonight on our bereaved list, we need to pray for the family of Sharon Fernandez. And so I did that funeral this afternoon in Jacksonville. There were seven people at that funeral. Five of them prayed to receive Christ. It's the person of the Lord and Savior. Amen. amen. I say amen a little louder. Amen. amen. This is a family that I know. I'm distantly related to them. Uh, they had grandparents with my same last name. And even one of their own young little daughters is in a nursing home tonight. We never have any idea of what people are going through. And I'm so thankful to not only be the pastor of Lockline Baptist Church, but I'm so humbled just to be a member because you reach out in love. And so today, there have been many text messages going around about these that are sick and prayer requests. And so let's please lift these folks up in prayer. And uh, Pam and I get cards from you all all the time. I know your card sending people. Send these cards. Reach out. Love on these people. They are struggling. Everywhere I turn, people are struggling. I had a grandfather that was thinking about committing suicide, and God intervened and stopped that. Give the Lord a hand to heal. And so we've just seen a lot of things going on. God's doing marvelous, miraculous things. And sometimes we get distracted by all the negatives or the sadness, but our God is in control. Now, if you have permission to call somebody's name out, you know somebody's sick or afflicted, and you want to call their name out, would you hold up your hand? By the way, last Wednesday night, we had to get off air because our dear uh, sister and friend, Miss Diana, was under the weather, but she's back with us tonight. Give Diana a hand. She's well and with us uh, tonight, and so we're thankful for that. Let's bow and pray. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you know somebody sick or afflicted, would you hold up a hand in their honor? Uh, Helen Burnett is at the ER right now, so we need to pray for Helen Burnett. That's why Misty and William are not here, so we need to remember add Helen Burnett to our prayer list. Anybody else tonight? Let's pray and ask God to be with these that are sick and afflicted and ask God to intervene in their lives right now. Chad Bilson, would you pray for these that are sick and afflicted, please, sir? Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now, Lord. And Lord, we just lift these up to the pastor and the names that he has brought up tonight. And Lord, you know what they need, you know what touch they need. And God, we just pray with the families and that have the loved ones like Wanda that are facing uh, maybe death at this time. God, we just uh, lift her up to you right now, God, with all these others. But Lord, we know that there's the other side of this too, the glorious side that she'll be seeing you and she'll be in a better place and help us remember that. God, we just uh, again lift all these up to you. Help us to be the witnesses we need to be for them. And God, that uh, even in our own lives I thank you God for what you're doing. In your name. Amen. 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 Make sure we're live. We are. Okay, great. Amen. Just now I had a good friend that's called. He's had a rough day. And I, I just want us to pray for these folks who are struggling. And he probably didn't realize I'm here, but let's just bow our heads and pray again. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you know somebody that's physically, mentally, or spiritually struggling tonight, would you hold up a hand in their arm? Thank you. God, in Jesus' name, for these that are struggling physically, mentally, and spiritually, God, I pray that you would give us a heartbeat for them. Thank you that you love us in spite of our sins. Romans 5, 8 says that you demonstrated your love toward us that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the kind of love you have. <clears throat> we thank you and praise you. Be with these that are hurting. Be with my friends right now that just called. God, they, they call because they're hurting. Please intervene in Jesus' name. Tonight as we pray, let's pray for the lost. And we have a number of those by their own mouth that are lost. And let's pray that God would intervene with the loss. And so the, uh, if you have somebody <coughs> come at that list, Miss Jeannie's here with our prayer team, Tracy's with our prayer team, let them know, get that name added. And let's pray for the loss tonight. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray that God 
would be with the lost tonight. Tracy, would you pray for me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to intercede on behalf of those who are far from you and far from the church. Lord, I pray that you would speak to their hearts, that you would just uh, go after them with a love that only you can bring, that you would search out their hearts and help them to realize by the power of the Holy Spirit that they need you more than life itself. And Lord, I pray for those that are at their wit's end. They're looking up through the bottom. Uh, like my friend today uh, from another state who let me know that they were at the end of their rope. And I ask, dear Lord, that you would minister to them. Lord, thank you for deliverance for those that have come to faith in you in the past several days. Uh, for those that were saved at the funeral that Brother Jeff was talking about. For those that were gloriously saved Sunday morning in Sunday school class. For those that were saved at the uh, Easter extravaganza. Uh, you're still in the saving business. And I thank you for that. Lord, for those that are disconnected from you as far as fellowship is concerned, they know they're saved, but they're not right with you. And I praise you for a little cousin who set things right in their hearts because you continue to pursue her. Uh, and she forgave those who hurt her and is back in fellowship with you because of the witness of her grandmother and people just like her. I'm thankful that I was able to pray for her. And Lord, we all have somebody like that on our hearts. So we ask, dear God, that you would just keep them in the forefront of our mind and may the Holy Spirit impress upon us how to pray. Uh, and for those that we can't mention, uh, for one reason or the other, we pray you minister to them in supernatural ways. We still believe you can save, Father, and we ask that you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yesterday at the Business Leaders Luncheon, we had two that were saved on Saturday at the Easter egg hunt. Six <coughs> men saved Saturday. Two of them were here yesterday at the Business and Community Leaders Luncheon. And then we had a young lady that was saved during Sunday school Sunday. She was at the business and community leaders lunch. So amen. amen. And our team just did a great job with that and I appreciate that. Tonight we want to uh, pray for those that are in military. If you look back on your uh, list uh, those that are in military Kit Bowen, Harrison Day, Brandon Dunlap, Anthony Hubbard, Josiah Marlowe, Isaac Perez, and then we're praying for my young friend Alex that I met on the airplane. And so we need to pray for those that are in military. We need to pray that God would intervene in our country tonight. And so let's pray for these that are serving tonight. And Hunter Douglas, would you pray for these, please? Let's pray for these that are serving tonight. And pray for our mayor, and our governor, and our president, our country tonight. Hunter. Our Father, we bring to you the problems of our nation and this world. We know that you know more about this than we do, but you've given us the privilege and the responsibility to approach the throne of grace. And so we beg grace upon the problems that we know about and that we face and that our brothers and sisters around us have to deal with every day. We pray that you'll watch over our neighbors in our neighborhood, our city and the county and the state and the nation, and especially those around the world who are suffering in such a serious matter even in war and so we pray for you to help your people and give us strength and give us power in this situation for it's in Christ's name we ask it amen. amen let me remind you of several things going on that you want to be aware of we have our next uh, Wednesday night we have our quarterly business meeting so I will pre-record and we will have our business meeting we need you to be here so that you know what's going on and so that's next Wednesday night. 
Also, we have a special Mother's Day uh, celebration and surprise in order for our mothers for Mother's Day. Please remember that. Our Why Why is coming up uh, and that first uh, Thursday in May, May 5th. And then on May 19th, we're going to the Governor's Mansion. If you would like to tour the Governor's Mansion with us, they're going to give us a per personal tour. And so please sign up. We're going to be going to lunch and then going to the Governor's Mansion. We're going to have a great time. And so please uh, be here to be a part of that on May 19th. And so we have a lot of things that we're getting ready for. Also, this coming Sunday at 5 o'clock, We'll have all of our activities. Hunter will be teaching. Our choirs will be going on. But Sunday Sanctuary, which is our ministry to students 18 to 32, will have a cookout at the pavilion. And so we have, they have a team. They're going to be doing all of that themselves. Say amen. amen. And so they're doing a Facebook post on the, our Facebook page for Sunday Sanctuary. And they're working that up. I'm hearing from those students. I've heard from them all day today because they're excited. And Trent is helping us with that. People in that age group are helping us with that. And so please be mindful of that. And so we have a lot of things going on. And then we're getting ready for vacation Bible school. We're going to have vacation Bible school for the children. And then the youth are going to be helping with the children. But we're also going to have a vacation Bible school for adults. And Hunter Douglas is going to teach that on Sunday night through Thursday night. Give Hunter a hand and thank him for being willing to do that. He'll have a classroom set up, and so you'll have a, a space. You can come and eat supper. Our Wednesday night Lifeline Cafe, they're going to be fixing supper. If you're going to come to be a part of that, we will have a sign-up sheet for you on Sunday uh, for that class. So Hunter will know how many to prepare for. And we want you to be with us to eat that, uh, that week uh, with our Vacation Bible School folks and so that we see people of every age group coming together for Vacation Bible School. How many of you went to Vacation Bible School as a child? Go ahead. Oh, good. And, and I'm not going to ask you if you're coming back. If you don't come back, then I'm going to sick you in my own. Okay? But you be here for Vacation Bible School that week. We're going to have a good time. I know Hunter Douglas, and he will have a good class. And we're going to have a good time. I cannot thank all of our volunteers enough for Saturday. We had volunteers everywhere. Had a great time. Fire department was talking about it. Police department talking about it yesterday. All of our partners were here yesterday that helped us on Saturday. Edwards Food Giant, Chick-fil-A, Otter Creek, 93.3 The Fish. Uh, we had the business leaders co-op folks that were here. Uh, T uh, Pine Grove Baptist Church was here yesterday. Everybody came support the business and community leaders luncheon. Dr. Stelligan did a great job. I've heard a lot of comments and texts about that, and they want to have him back at some point. Our speaker next month for the business and community leaders luncheon is David Ware, and he's our state historian, and he's going to be talking to us about the 300, or however you say that, the 300th anniversary of our city. Director Adcock was giving her prizes out yesterday. I got one of those. And if, if you had a, an inkling to know what it was, it was a, a pendant of a rock that said the Little Rock on it. And uh, it's a piece of rock that reminds us of Little Rock. And so David Ware, our state historian, will be here next month. Jake Nabholtz from Nabholtz Construction will be here in June. And uh, we're working with the school district and praying for the new superintendent. So there are a lot of things going on. We're going to sing together tonight. We're going to start with hymn number 376. Hymn number 376. And so tonight we're going to sing. Make sure that you have some ready for us. Our choir's getting ready, and we're looking forward to them leading us. So we'll pick two, three, four songs here. And Sing together if you'd like a solo. Volunteer Margaret, and she'll sing a solo tonight. We're going to have a good time and, and worship the Lord together. 376. Have faith in God. This is the day to live by faith and not by fear. Amen.
3. Have faith in God in your pain and your sorrow. Mm. His heart is touched with, with your grief and despair. Yeah. Cast all your cares and your burdens upon him and leave them there. Oh, leave them there. Say those last two phrases with me, please. Leave them there. Oh, leave them there. When we pray and have faith in God, we need to leave things at the throne of God because we can't do anything about it, but God can do everything about it. Leave them there. Leave them there. Somebody pick this one out. Yes, ma'am. 461. 461. Okay. If I don't know it, we'll get Hunter to direct it. We'll leave poor him all alone tonight. I love to tell the story. 461.
and thank her for reading. Tonight, as we study God's Word, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Make sure that you have your Bibles open there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as we go back to the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And tonight, we're looking at 1 Corinthians. We know that 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, tells us that Paul had already written an epistle to the church at Corinth, but we do not have it. It doesn't worry me. I believe that we have what God wants us to have. I believe that God is sovereign and in control. And I believe that when I have a problem with that sovereignty, it's because I would rather have my will than God's will, and we collide here. We collide together. So tonight, let me remind you as we study God's Word together that we look at five things, and we do have new folks with us, and so I want to remind you of that tonight. As we look at these five things, we understand that we look at the title, we look at the outline of the book, and then we look at the uh, key verses, the individual that God used to write the book, and then we look at the date. So the title, the outline, key verses, the author, and then the date. And tonight we're still in key verses because this is a loaded book. We're not doing an expository study. However, we are spending a lot of time in the uh, epistle of, to the church at Corinth because of the great detail of the amount of theology that we find in the book of 1 Corinthians. It is very applicable to the New Testament church, to say the least. And so tonight we're going to read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. Then we will stop, and then we'll come back and we'll read 8 through 13 after I make a few comments about 13. So let's read 1 Corinthians 13. You know that this is the chapter of love. Very seldom do I do a wedding that someone does not want this chapter at the wedding. Sometimes when I do a funeral, people want this chapter at their funeral because this is the chapter of love. Now let me remind you what we know about love from the New Testament. Of course, we have the most famous scripture of all Christendom found in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so that tells us about God's love. In St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, we find the purpose statement of our church, and many find their purpose statements. When they came to Jesus, they were trying to frame him for blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and they asked him which was the great commandment in the law. Rabbi, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments, saying the law and the prophets. And so he tells us that God so loved the world and then that we're to love God, all of our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. God, neighbor, self. Say it with me, please. God, neighbor, self. And since, so we know that love comes from God, and then we're to love God back. So God has to give us love so that we can love him back. Now let me say this to you. All of our other relationships are built upon that love. And so if we do not love God, we probably will not love the people around us. We definitely will not love them in a godly fashion. And so then we see not only does love come from God, we're to give it back to God. So it's kind of like an arrow coming down from heaven, going back up to heaven. But then in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, and we've covered Romans, the, in the Roman road, the Bible says that God demonstrates his love toward us, that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God loved us, we're to love God, and God demonstrates that love toward us, even while we're sinners, in spite of our sin, God loves us. And then 1 Corinthians teaches us about love and how to express that love. And we'll talk about that tonight. But then we understand what love is from John's epistle, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Say that with me. 
God is love. And so we know that love comes from God, that we're to give it back to God. And as we give it back to God, the people that are here, they are recipients of that. It passes through them, goes to God directly. We love God first and then our neighbor as ourselves. And so we have a priority of love. Let me say this to you. You need to love God for, foremost uh, above all other things. And if you don't, everybody else will suffer around you. If you do not love God with priority, uh, foremost, God first, everybody else will suffer around you. And then we're told that God demonstrates his love toward us in our sin. He loved us. So that teaches us that we're to love people in spite of their sin. I need to love my neighbor in spite of his or her sin. Say that in your head. I need to love my neighbor in spite of his or her sin. Not when they sin against me and they do not ask me to forgive them. I, I'm not, I don't get a freebie. God always tells me to love my neighbor regardless of whether they sin against me, ask me to forgive them, or even if they change. Sometimes we think, well, I can only love the people that I can love, or I can only love the people that change, or I can only love the people that do what I want them to do. That's manipulation. That is not love. So what is love? God is love. This word is agape, and that's the word that we're going to look at tonight, 1 Corinthians 13. So agape, as far back as you go in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, Aramaic, and then by the time that you got to the Latin and the Greek, the word love means the attitude, the actions, and the answers of God. Attitude, actions, answers. Attitude, actions, answers. So if I want to know if I love Pam, then I have to check all three. Attitude, actions, answers. If I want to know if I love my children, I have to check all three. Attitude, actions, answers. Answers. If I want to know that I love my enemy, whoever that may be, I have to check all three. Attitude, actions, answers. Now, sometimes we want to pick and choose whom we love, and that's not love. And so please understand that God teaches us the priority of love. And so tonight we're going to read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now we're going to stop right there just for a few moments. Now I want you to understand that last week and the week before, we, well last week we didn't get into our study, but the two weeks before we were on spiritual gifts. Notice that Paul continues in an expository way his study of gifts and he says that these gifts are colonized in love. They come to fruition in love. It doesn't matter. Each and every Christian has a spiritual gift. I believe probably more than one. It doesn't matter how many spiritual gifts you have or how many times you exercise them. If you do not do it in love, for love, because of love, the spiritual gifts have done you no good. And so he lists these spiritual gifts. He starts with tongues. Now let me remind you that I define this word tongues as glossia, which is the Greek definition of this word, and it means a known language to someone at some point. It goes back to Acts chapter 2. They were in a room, the Holy Spirit came upon them like a mighty rushing wind, and they heard people speak in their own tongue, in their own language. And so we understand what that means. So he starts with tongues, because tongues was on the forefront of the spiritual gifts in Paul's day, and for some people, it still is. People will ask me, have you spoken in tongues? I'll say yes. All over South America, I spoke in English, had a translator in Spanish. And so it makes sense because our God is Lagos, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word is God. That word for capital W-O-R-D is Lagos. We get our word confession from it, logic. Our God is a logical God. Say that with me if you think that. Our God is a logical God. 
And so it would only make sense because if I were saying something that I could not define, then I would not know if it were praising God or, or if it were cursing God. And so I need to be very careful with my tongue. Boy, I have enough time uh, understanding people, and people have enough time understanding me without throwing in something that's not logical that I can't define what I've said. And so he starts with the spiritual gift of tongues. Then he moves on in, and he says, that though I speak with the tongues of men, notice this. He says the tongues of men, not on the unknown tongues, but the tongues of men and of angels. Okay, and the, we know that angels speak because we have the episode of Satan in the form of a serpent. Now, remember that when Satan's kicked out of heaven, Isaiah 14, 12, best picture of that. I know it's a picture of the king of Babylon, but it's also a picture of Satan because the king of Babylon did not have an eternal past. This guy has an eternal past. So I believe it's a picture of Satan. Remember that Satan had been kicked out of heaven. He's a fallen angel. I'd rather be a human being than an angel because angels only get one shot. You and I get grace. He is communicating with Adam and Eve. He doesn't communicate in an unknown tongue. He communicates in an audible voice. He communicates with a language that they understand that's translated in the Hebrew, then translated in the Latin, and ultimately in the Greek, and now we have it in the English. Friend, let me say to you, if a serpent can speak to Adam and Eve because God is allowed him to, then we should understand what praises God and what does not. That makes sense not your head. That's important. Notice that the angel of the Lord, we're going to be in Joshua chapters 1 and 2 this week in our Sunday school lesson. And the angel of Yahweh spoke, and this angel spoke to these people in an audible voice. They could understand it. Translated from the Hebrew, translated to the Latin, translated from the Greek, translated into English. God preserved our language. And so he says, though I speak with the tongues of men, of angels, but do not have love. And this word love, we get to it in chapter 13. Some, the old King James translated it charity. Okay, charity. But it is the Greek New Testament word agape. It is the Greek New Testament word agape. And so again, it goes back to the attitude, the actions, the answers of God. Though I have tongues, but I have love, I do not have love, I become noisy, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Verse 2. Notice that he's talking about the gifts, no doubt, because he uses the word gift, which is keros. <coughs> now please notice this, that the word gift here is keros, which can be closely related to the word that we use for charity. And so people say, well, love is a gift of God. Well, you get love when you get God. You get love when you get saved. You get God, a full dose of God. God fully equips you when you get saved. But this word love, no doubt, is, is agape, the attitude, the actions, and the uh, answers of God. And out of that, we're able to use our spiritual gifts. We love. We love. We love. Love. And God used this church because you love. That's why God's left this church on this corner. Because you love. And so then he talks about the gift of prophecy, the gift of knowledge and mysteries, and then the gift of faith. Uh, enough to remove mountains, but you do not have love, you're nothing. Again, the word of God. Verse 3. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So we have the gift of giving. So you see the spiritual gift of tongues, the spiritual gift of prophecy, the spiritual gift of knowledge, the spiritual gift of, of uh, faith, and the spiritual gift of giving, being helpful. And so, and you all are givers. That was obvious on Saturday, as you not only gave your time, but then cleaned up after it. Obvious last Wednesday night when Miss Diana was sick. You gave your time and you helped clean up after it. Now somebody said to me, well, uh, preacher, you were praying with your eyes open. Sometimes I pray with my eyes open. Sometimes I pray with my eyes closed. There's nothing the Bible says about praying with your eyes closed. We close our eyes and bow our heads so that we give God our undivided attention. But for some reason, last Wednesday night, I prayed with my eyes open. Some of you are worth keeping my eye on all the time. Go ahead and say amen. Okay? And so when I saw about halfway through my prayer, I saw Miss Diana get up. Somebody online said, you said, 
And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Turn that thing <laughs> off and call 911. I can quit, okay? But our 911 is Jesus because of love. If you get that, hold up your hand, okay? I need to have Jesus on the speed dial. 911, Jesus is love. And I can't forget to love. And I'm reminded of that every time I serve God at Lockline Baptist Church because I serve with people that love God. And they love God, and they love God's people unconditionally. You all never put a condition on God's love, and I commend you for that. It's like uh, the Apostle John commended the churches in the, in the book of Revelation. I commend you for the way that you love. You taught me how to love, and you take people that think that they're unlovable and you bring them in and love on them because everybody is somebody in the kingdom of God and I commend you for that. Now as we think about this uh, passage of scripture on love, love, please notice that in chapter 13 in verses 1 through 3 we find love's motivation. And so I outline these books as I, I outline these chapters as I go. So 13, 1 through 3 is love's motivation. Love's motivation. Now we're going to look at love's meaning according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Listen to what he says love's meaning is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love that does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffer. It doesn't keep score. You wronged me seven times, I'm going to wrong you seven times. Love keeps no score. Number Verse 6, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but love rejoices in the truth. You can do a lot of things to me, but don't ever lie to me. I do not like to be lied to. And my mother and my daddy taught me a long time ago, now my mother would beat the devil out of me and get me multiple spankings. My dad never touched me. He spanked all three of my sisters, and I relish in telling people that. Too. Yeah, but, he, but I would have rather had a spanking ten times over than to have one of his lectures. But I knew the man loved it. And I'll never forget one of the first times publicly that I did something to disobey my dad. And I got caught with some men that he worked with in a movie theater, seeing a movie I was not supposed to see. And the next night at our dinner table, my dad said to me, Son, how was that movie you saw last night? I knew by the tone of his questioning that he knew which movie I had seen. And I said, Oh, it was pretty good. He said, I want to hear all about it after supper. Boy, I didn't need another bite of supper. <laughs> supper was over. And when he got through, he said, Son... And he didn't ever ask me which one I'd seen. He said, son, you have no idea how ashamed I was when my workers came in and wanted to know why in the world I allowed my son to go see an R-rated movie. I was 14, looked like I was 24. And he said, what would you have done if Jesus had come in and sat next, uh, next to you and said, Jeffrey Dial, what are you doing in this theater? I had no answer. And, but friend, he loved me. And he loved me enough to confront my sin. And so love rejoices in the truth. And so that's one of the reasons I spend so much time in confessional discipleship. Number one, we've got to get on the same logic with God. Number two, we've got to get on the same logic with the people that we're closest to. Number three, we need to be on the same logic as God's people. That's why we have business meeting next week. People say, well, I don't come to business meeting. I trust, and they learn this little saying, I trust God with you, Pastor. Be in business meeting. So you know what the world's going on in your church? We're a congregational-led church. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit, not by man. We want to walk with God behind Him. We don't want to get in front of Him or have the audacity to walk to the side of Him. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He loved us first so that we could love Him back. And he demonstrates that love. And he teaches us what it is. Now when you look at this list, notice that it says in verse 7, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now sometimes people will say to me, Well, I don't have enough love to endure this. 
My relationship's not going to make it. I don't know if my parenting skills are going to make it. I don't know if my marriage is going to make it. I can't endure. You can't endure. But love can. Because God is love. Say that with me again. God, God is, is love. love. Now when you look at the meaning of love, love is patient, kind, not jealous. You, you remember, if, if you parallel these meanings in verses 4 through 7, take them back and compare them to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. It's really cool to understand the parallelism between the Ten Commandments and Paul's definition of love. Remember, Paul was a Jew of Jews, trained at the feet of Gamaliel, was high-class persecutor of the church, was on his way to get permission to persecute better when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And so he has to be asking himself this question, how could I say that I love God, that I was going to be a part of the murdering death of Stephen and multiple Christians? How can I say that I love God, that I hate so-and-so? We can say that I love God and hate Satan because Satan is the epitome of sin and sin nature. But when we say, I love God, but I hate so-and-so, the two mix like oil and water. They do not go together. And so notice that he says in this passage of Scripture, it uh, not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, does, it is not provoked. Boy, I, I learned a long time ago, years ago, as your pastor, probably just a few years after being here, was on a trip in an airport and talked about the love of God, tried to exhibit that. We were getting ready for world changers, got in the airport, wasn't going to get home when I wanted to get home, threw myself a little hissy fit. One of the most embarrassing nights of my life. Okay? It was wrong because I allowed something to provoke me. I've learned the hard way that when I allow myself to get angry, it's not the person who angered me that has the sin problem. It's Jeff's sin problem that I need to be concerned about the moment that I become angry. So I'll have guys in confessional discipleship, since I've been here, two of them have called tonight, one earlier and one just now. And one of them sent me a text earlier in the week and said, I'm sorry I didn't get back to you. I said to that individual, and I try my best to mean it, I have no chaos, no confusion policy. I'm not going to get upset with you because you don't text me back. Now, I told you that's one of my pet peeves. Can't even be a pet peeve. We've got to get rid of our pet peeves and those little things that tick us off. Thank you. Yeah. If you know of something that ticks you off, pray to God diligently, nightly. God, take it away from me. Because if I get angry, and blow my testimony, I could keep multitudes of people from Christ. And it's not worth it. My integrity is not for sale. Say that with me. My integrity is not for sale. Now notice that he says, it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own. That's selflessness. Most of the time, we live in a very selfish world. <laughs> But when we're not seeking our own, we're not out for best for me, then I'm selflessness. And, and Paul talks about emptying ourselves. We've got to allow God to do that. I can't do it. You can't do it. Keeps no account of wrong suffered. Boy, we keep a score. We keep a record. The, the other night, I told you Sunday, I was bandaged from head to toe. I'm not bandaged, but I still ain't. Huh. And, uh, they, but last Friday night, I was on the campus of UALR, and that I was, there was a little boy right, dotted right out in front of me. I was about to walk over and step over a concrete uh, curb. And Tracy made a joke. Tracy, what was your joke about the curb? Oh, I told him he had too much curb appeal. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you, you told me that Sunday morning right after church and I was still aching. I didn't find it as humorous as my wife did. And so, but here's the deal. Suddenly it flashed in front of me that if I ran into that little boy, I saw that concrete pile. And I realized that if I ran into that little boy, he's going to bang his head against that concrete pile. And boy, I didn't know how acrobatic I was. And I felt it. I went up in the air, 
The coach came running over. I just met the coach. My soccer guys were a little embarrassed. Just met the coach, and they the coach came running over to me, and he said, Pastor, Pastor, are you okay? And I said, no, but I will be. <laughs> and, and, and he said, I'm sorry, but I've just got to laugh. <laughs> I said, well, I'd laugh too if it weren't me. <laughs> Friend, let me say to you, notice at the end of this, it says, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It, it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Regardless of your situation tonight, I want you to think about the motive of love, the meaning in love. And I want you to think about hope. You realize that now I've dealt with about 26 or 27 suicidal situations since the beginning of COVID. Two of them have been successful. Only two. The reason that so many people are suicidal today is because they've lost hope. But love hopes all things. <coughs> Friend, I don't have a hope that the schoolhouse or the state house or the White House is going to get it right. But I have a hope that God has it right already. I have a hope that God is on his throne, as it said. Have faith in God. When all else fails about you, he sees and knows he's on his throne. If you believe that, say amen. 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 But notice what he says at the end of this, verse 7. Endures all things. Mm. This teaches me that God will always have a church. God will always have a people. As sparse as they may become, before the end of the age, God will always have a people. <coughs> my phone was going off the hook Friday evening, late Friday night after my fall, because Walnut Ridge had a massive uh, storm and tornado on the ground, and there were three, some people said, five inches of hail on the ground. I was getting picture after picture after picture of hail that looked like snow all over everything. My mother-in-law, my brother-in-law's cars were beat up. Not going; they're drivable, but that's about it. And so you, you remember the hail, the plagues of hail in the Old Testament. Friend, let me say to you: I do not know when Jesus is coming back, but I believe He's coming back. And I can safely say we're closer to the end of the age than any other generation has ever been. But we've got to endure. Just like today. Boy, it's been a long day. People sick and afflicted and struggling everywhere I've turned. T talking to Brian earlier, I I've gone from one thing to the other, one meeting to the other, not even a second part of in between to get there. And every time I do, there's a lifeline to go with me. Volunteer. Can I drive you here? Can I do this? Can I do that? But most of all, everywhere you go, everywhere I go, God goes with us. That's how we endure. God is with me. Who can be against me? Right. So please notice the meaning, and we're going to finish this. Notice the maturity of love. You have to be mature to understand love. That's why I'm convinced divorce rates are at an all-time high. Notice the motive, the meaning, the maturity of love. Notice what he says in verse 8. Love never fails, but there are gifts of prophecy. He goes back to the gifts and the comparison. He's expository teaching. Love never fails, but there are gifts of prophecy. They will be done away. There are tongues. They will cease. If there's knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. We're partially through. Notice what he says in verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. The reason that our children and that our students are not mature is because most of our adults are not maturing. Right. We've not discipled them. And instead of throwing stones at who didn't and who did and, and griping about this or griping about that, we need to get busy. We've got a lot of work to do. Instead of wasting time talking about what we should have done or what we need to do, let's just do it. And thank God we're in a church that does that. Say amen. Amen. Now notice what he says. When I 
was a child. I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. If you're an adult, it's time for you to grow up. It's time for me to grow up and put away the childish things of our past. And then notice what he says in verse 12. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I will know in part, but then I will be known fully, just as I have also been fully known. But now, faith, hope, love. Now he separates these things from the spiritual gifts. He categorizes basically spiritual gifts like the triunity of God, faith, hope, love. Abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. He's not comparing them the way that we would compare God the Father to God the Spirit or God the Son. Do not hear me say that. But he dividing these spiritual gifts out, faith, hope, love. And so you can take the list of spiritual gifts in Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians and boil them down to faith, hope, love. Say it with me. Faith, hope, love. Say it again. Faith, hope, love. I have to have faith to experience hope. And I can't get the love without hope. And this generation's lost hope. I had a young man who texted me late yesterday evening. And he said, you're the only person in my life that prays for me. And then he said this, you're the only man in my life that's never wanted anything but good for me. And hear what he said. He's a young man, 24 years old. He said, you're the only person that prays for me. And I'm not being boastful. You're the only man that's never wanted anything but good for me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, every other man that I've known has wanted something bad for me. Or wanted me to do something bad. This guy's in Little Rock, Arkansas. He's not around the world where they've never heard the gospel. He's in Little Rock, Arkansas, in the middle of the Bible Belt. I met him at a restaurant and said, can I pray for you? We're going to pray. Can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? And he told me exactly what to pray for. And if I hadn't have been sitting, sitting down, I probably would have fallen down because his prayer request was bold. He struggled. Faith, hope, love, the maturity of love. Now, I like this passage of Scripture because it reminds me that when I get to heaven, I'm going to recognize my loved ones. 30... Uh, one years ago, excuse me, 32 years ago, no, 31 years ago today, my grandfather was ill in an intensive care unit. My mom called me and said, I think you need to come home. It was the third weekend of April, which is our family reunion weekend until I became the head of the family reunion and, and my cousin and I, and we had to move it to June because a lot of times the third weekend fell on Easter weekend and it would have this weekend. So I got to the hospital. And you've heard me tell this story before. Ultimately, the nurse came out. I had done a funeral that day, so I was dressed much like I am today. And the nurse said, are you a preacher? And I said, yes. And she said, can you come in? We have a man dying. Now, this was one of my greatest heroes of life, not only of faith, but of life. And I love my mom and dad, and I love my grandpa. They were right up there together. And I walked in, and he had crystal clear blue eyes just like Jane Owens. And he said, son, how are you? And I said, I'm fine. And she had told me he was dying. She took me to his bed. I didn't know it was him. I said, how are you? And he said, I said, how are you, grandpa? He said, I'm fine. She said, you told me you were a preacher. You didn't tell me he was your grandpa. You lied to me. And I said, no, I didn't lie to you. I am a preacher. He is not. She said, you've got to leave. And I said, no, ma'am, I'm going to stay right here. <laughs> and I began to pray. And he smiled. And his hand fell out of mine. 31 years ago today. I had preached a lot of funerals by that time. But never anyone that was close to me. And I can clearly say to you, I thought about I wasn't married yet. He'd been married for over 60 years and had had 19 children. 
and he wanted me to get married and have seven. <laughs> and Pam agreed. <laughs> and he had already met Pam, and he said, son, the day you get married, I'm going to dance at your wedding. Somebody said to me earlier tonight, well, I don't feel like I have much faith. I said, I think you have more faith than you think because you're going through it. If you sit down and you give up, you go in the closet, you isolate without God, you're not enduring. People say, well, I don't know how to make it through. None of us do. But we make it through with God because God is love. Love, love. Jim, you can close us in prayer, please. Lord, help us to love like you do. Because you loved us, Lord, when we were very unlovely, when we were sinners. Thank you for that. Thank you for the hope that we have, Lord, that even when we face death, and when our loved ones face death, that you're there to carry us through. Thank you for the hope that we have in heaven. I just pray, Lord, that uh, we'll be sitting back as we uh, rub shoulders with the world because they need that kind of hope and love too. So, uh, do it.